Since elementary school, Americans have been taught that African Americans came to America as African slaves by the way of the transatlantic slave trade. Many African American elders say otherwise. I remember when I asked my elders some questions about our family origins. My grandmother said that she was Indian and that her mother was a full-blooded Cherokee woman. She also mentioned nothing about slavery. Being that I was too young to understand, I was puzzled. Who do I believe? My elder or my school teachers? Since the beginning of chattel slavery in America, the identity of American Indians has been distorted. When eugenics, immigration, and white bleaching policies increased in the Americas, the desire to eradicate darker Indians with Negro features from American Indian tribes did as well. When racism and colorism collide, you get paper genocide. What does the term paper genocide mean? Paper genocide is when American Indians are labeled as black, white, colored, mulatto, or even Negro. It's worth noting that paper genocide is not limited to American Indians. In fact, indigenous people from all over the world are affected by paper genocide to this day. The concept of race is defined by a person's phenotype, not by their genealogy records. When asked what makes someone black, they will simply state it is because of their dark skin. That is insufficient justification for calling someone black, let alone a misnomer. Before 1900, few American Indians were counted on the federal census. The 1790 to 1840 census do not list American Indians. However, Indians in the general population are first identified in 1860. Conveniently, a fire at the Department of Commerce in 1921 destroyed nearly all of the 1890 census schedules. Beginning with the 1900 census, Indians were counted both on and off reservations. Many believe that these uncounted Indians perished as a result of disease or warfare. However, this is not the case. They were reclassified and erased from history. So how does this act of paper genocide affect American Indian identity? Simple. When the registrar counts and sees him slash her as a Negro. Many Indians have endured paper genocide and have fought tooth and nail to get their Aboriginal birthrights restored. However, not all of their attempts were successful. Paper genocide shows us that you will always be seen as some nigga regardless of your indigenous documentation. He calls himself Ghost Dog. I don't know, a lot of these black guys today, these gangster type guys, they all got names like that they make up for themselves. Huh. He means like the rappers. You know, the rappers, they all got names like that. Snoop Doggy Dog, Ice Cube, Q-Tip, Method Man. My favorite was always Flavor Flay from Public Enemy. I don't know anything about that. But it makes me think about Indians. You know, they got names like uh, Red Cloud, Crazy Horse, Running Bear, Black Elk. That kind of shit. Yeah, Indians, niggas, same thing. Please keep in mind that each landmass has its own Aboriginal Negro population. Aboriginal Americans are the original inhabitants of America, and many are labeled as Negroes. Many scholars focus on the narrative that African Americans derive from the millions of African slaves to justify why so many Negroes are in America. The number of Africans shipped to America has been exaggerated and inaccurately reported. Since grade school, Americans were taught that 12 million Africans came to the United States as slaves. However, this teaching is a fabrication. Multiple sources estimate that it was actually 92,000 to 388,000 Africans were shipped to the United States as slaves, not millions.
Many people believe tracing African genealogy is impossible and they result to taking a DNA ancestry test. However, since the arrival of Europeans and Moors in America, they have kept records of both immigrants and Indians, whether slaves or free. The SlaveVoyages.org website has now completed 10 years of successful operation, drawing on four decades of archival research on five continents, a revolution in computer processing costs, and with major funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the UK's Arts and Humanities Research Board, the site now offers access to details of more than 36,000 slave trading voyages between Africa and the New World, a further 11,400 voyages from one part of the Americas to another part of the Americas, and 92,000 Africans who were forced to make these voyages. The role of slave voyages as the basic reference tool for the slave trade to the Americas and now within the Americas is well established. However, most African Americans lack written proof of their African origins not because of the white men attempting to conceal it from them, nor is it because of the transatlantic slave trade, but because most African Americans are not African to begin with. Many DNA ancestry companies promise black Americans that they can trace their origins to an African tribe and well, I allow the experts to put you up on game about that. DNA testing can determine where in Africa our forebears were from. Among those using the test to trace their family's past, Spike Lee, Oprah Winfrey, and actor Isaiah Washington, one of the stars of Grey's Anatomy. To Vi Higginson, the prospect of tracing even a tiny fraction of her ancestry back to Africa was enthralling. 60 Minutes sent her DNA to African Ancestry, as well as to several other genetic genealogy companies, to see what they could tell us about Vi's maternal lineage. So what do we know about Vi's ancestry? The DNA does indicate that she has distant relatives in the Mende tribe, but she also has relatives in all those other tribes. So no one can say for sure where Vi's maternal ancestor actually came from. When I handed Vi the certificate. She got extremely emotional about it. She wept, and it meant so very much. People want to believe. They want to believe they've gotten an answer. And it's not fair of us to let them believe that we're giving them certain answers, because scientifically, we just can't. Hank Greeley is concerned that the science isn't really there yet for, for you to be giving them the name of a tribe. I think for most companies, I, I would be concerned too. But what about your own company? We, we have he the largest. He didn't exclude you. <laughs> he included you. But we have the largest um, uh, set of uh, sequences from Africa, and so yep. with that, with that, we're able to provide some level of probability in terms of frequency. But he would say that even though you have the largest database, it's still small on the scope of things. As I said, I share those those concerns about yourself. Our DNA. And that's the rub. This business of genetic genealogy is fraught with limitations. For one thing, it can only provide information about a tiny fraction of our ancestry. Because we get half our DNA from our mothers and half from our fathers, almost all of our DNA gets shuffled and remixed every generation, making it impossible to trace what comes from whom. There are just two bits of DNA that remain pure, the Y chromosome, which passes directly from father to son, and something called mitochondrial DNA, which passes unchanged from mother to child. Hank Greeley, a law professor at Stanford University, has studied this new field. He worries that people don't realize just how many ancestors they actually have. Eight generations ago, both you and I had 256 great-great-great-great-great-great-grandparents. Wait, you're saying that if you go back eight generations, uh -huh. we have 256 great-great-great-great-grandparents? Yes, it doubles every generation. So you've got two parents, you have four grandparents, you have eight great-grandparents, <laughs> 16 great-great-grandparents, and it adds up fast. It adds up so fast, in fact, that if you go back 
20 generations. You've got over a million grandparents. 1,048,576 to be exact. And in each generation, DNA testing can provide information about only two of them. So you could be Peruvian on your mother's 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 side, Japanese on your father's 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 <laughs> side, Swedish on everything else. <laughs> and you'll and, never know. And you'll never know the Swedish from the Y chromosome oh or the God. mitochondrial DNA. Now you've looked at several of these companies that are doing these tests. Yes. Do you think that they explain what you just explained to us? No. Uh, I don't think any of them does as good a job of pointing out the limitations. But, you know, businesses often don't go around telling you how weak their product is. We don't oversell. I mean, we just say, look, we provide a service. If you're interested in exploring a tiny bit of your DNA and trace its ancestry, we can do that. When you say it's a tiny little amount? It's less than 0.1%. And that's pretty teeny. Yeah, but for people who know nothing about any of them, I think it's very important. The tens of millions of Indians who vanished following 1492 did not all perish in America's Holocaust. Slave catchers would traffic millions of Indians as slaves to Europe and Africa. The slave trade didn't start with Africa. The transatlantic slave trade started in America with American Indians. When people think of American slavery, they don't think of the enslavement of Native Americans. Why is this? Well, partly because the enslavement of Native Americans occurred first. And uh, no, was, say that again, please. Say uh, that again. The, the enslavement of Native Americans really began before the enslavement of uh, Africans, uh, not only in the Caribbean uh, by the Spanish, where it was extremely extensive. Uh, and in the Caribbean, I might mention that the, the numbers were huge that were involved. And um, they had several kinds of slaves. Uh, they had the, the normal slave, uh, but they also had people who were called, uh, well, they were called uh, Indians from the useless islands. They were from islands where there was no gold. And so they had the right to go and remove people from those from islands. The useless islands? Yeah. What do yeah. You, what, what well, do Jamaica, mean? for example, would be a useless island because it had no gold. Inutiles, not useful. Uh, and they needed labor so badly on uh, Haiti, where the gold was found, Haiti, okay. and Cuba, uh, that they were stealing people constantly and removing them by force from other islands. Even after it was no longer technically uh, in the best uh, or possible, legally even, to enslave, they still could remove them as forced free labor. We could call it later coolie labor. In the early 1500s, they started bringing in a few African slaves, but uh, they had... Uh, some second thoughts because many of the Africans ran away and joined the native people. And there were major rebellions, uh, particularly uh, famous on the island of Haiti, led by a, um, an Indian chief named uh, Enriquillo or Enriquez, who um, uh, had Africans as well as Native Americans in his rebellion. There were a number of them. He held off for a little while. They thought uh, the mixture was too dangerous. Um, they were also very worried because some of the Africans, particularly from Senegal, uh, were Muslims. And they didn't want Islam, they didn't want Judaism either, but they didn't want any foreign religion but Christianity spreading in the Americas. Um, in any case, uh, what happened was that uh, about 15, 15, 15, 20, uh, they began bringing in many more Africans again. So you get, uh, again, the Native American being the first slaves in the region and then African slaves coming in and supplementing their numbers. Captured and sold to adjacent counties and towns, American Indians were to work on plantations. Millions of Indians were transported from America to Europe, Spain, the Caribbean, and Africa as a commodity in exchange for resources. Slave traders often wrote these Indians as African slaves, Negro, or Black. The United States did not import a massive colony of Africans from Africa. Somehow these details of history are not talked about in school textbooks. In Virginia, records that indicated that someone was of American Indian descent was changed to colored. 
No matter if the Indian was biracial or not, lawmakers did, however, use the transatlantic slave trade as a scapegoat to justify enforcing eugenics and xenophobic laws. Although very few Africans were sent to America as slaves, Indian agents, census takers, and other registrars had no problem labeling full-blooded and mixed Indians as Negro or colored. According to a German ethnologist in the 1800s named George Frederici, in his analysis of Portuguese sources, he states, and I quote, among the regrettable practices which have resulted in the disparagement of the Indians, one prime abuse is the unjustifiable and scandalous practice of calling them Negroes. Perhaps by so doing, the intent was no other than to induce in them the belief that by their origins they had been destined to be the slaves of whites, as is generally conceded by the case of blacks from the coast of Africa. Therefore, the directors will not permit henceforth that anybody may refer to an Indian as a Negro, nor that they may use this epithet among themselves, as is currently the case. The U.S. government is terrified that more American Indians that are now mislabeled as colored, Negro, Black, or even African American may uncover their true history and genetic lineage. The U.S. administration fears this awakening. This is the reason why they went to so many great lengths to do paper genocide on American Indian people so they don't have to give American Indians the payouts. And if they do give the American Indians the payout, they are more than likely to give it to the white Indians or the biracial or multiracial Indians. However, not all black Americans have the same ancestors and not all Negro people are of African descent. Good evening and welcome to For the People and the final part of our conversation with Dr. Jack Forbes, author of Black Africans and Native Americans. With the enslavement of Native Americans and Africans by Europeans came a maze of racial and caste designations. In this segment, we learned that the term Negro didn't apply just to Africans, but to Native Americans as well. Well, uh, the Portuguese particularly uh, begin using the term uh, negro or black for a wide variety of people uh, other than people from Africa. Uh, They apply the term uh, very commonly to the native people of India uh, and to other areas of Southeast Asia. Uh, But uh, when they arrive in Brazil, they also use the term for the native people of Brazil. Uh, They call the Indians of Brazil negros da terra, which means uh, natives of the land. And uh, then later when they begin uh, bringing people over from Africa, they call them negros da guine, uh, black people from Guinea. Uh, This term negro is just used very commonly, interchangeably with indio. So you become, uh, I I become convinced that uh, basically what the Portuguese meant by negro was non-white. In other words, any group of people who were not white would be categorized that way. And that Indians, therefore, were just another kind of uh, non-whites or Negroes. The term was also used in a very similar way by um, uh, English-speaking people. And not only uh, in Britain, but also in the United States area, you find instances where people who are clearly of Native American ancestry are categorized as Negro or Black. The term black is used in English uh, interchangeably with Negro very often, a black moor in England. Um, So it's a a term that uh, we have to watch out for. In 1719, for instance, the uh, government of South Carolina decreed that um, all persons who were not full-blood Indians, such as mustis and mulattoes, which I'll mention in a moment, uh, would be classified as Negroes. So when we find lists of slaves uh, during that period of time, and subsequently, of course, 
uh, where it says there were so many uh, Negroes. This does not necessarily mean pure blood Africans. Uh, it can be people of various kinds of Indian and African mixtures. Uh, now, I mentioned a couple of words there, musty and um, uh, mulatto. Mulatto uh, is a term that developed, uh, I think, in Spain or Portugal, probably derived from an Arabic term, either muwalad, a term meaning one who is assimilated or adopted into the Arabic community, or uh, from the term maula, uh, which means one who has a feudal obligation, uh, including uh, the obligation of parent, uh, of child to parent. In other words, in the, that, that system, uh, a son was considered to have a relationship uh, of malado, as it's called in Portuguese, to the patriarch of the family. Uh, from either of those terms, or from both coming together, I think the term mulatto evolves. It's not probably originally a, a racial term per se, uh, but gradually it comes to mean a person who is essentially half Africa and half something else. But in the West Indies particularly, we see uh, an example after example in Spanish royal decrees and the definitions that are given, given by Spanish officials as well as by Native American writers, the term mulatto means primarily black and Native American. Not black and white, but black and Native American. Turning to the French colonies, we also find that the term uh, mulat or its equivalent in French uh, was used for people of, of American, Native American, and French ancestry, even without any African ancestry, in the Louisiana area, for instance. And the same thing is true in, in the British colonies along the Atlantic seaboard. In Virginia in 1705, for instance, the government uh, decrees that the child of an Indian will be known as a mulatto. That is, a person who's half white and Indian, half African and Indian, will be a mulatto. Legally. Okay, let me cut you off here because we don't want to keep you here all day. The significance of this being what? What is the lesson? What is this, what is this telling us? Well, there are several things that are significant about it. Of course, one of them is the way that colonialism uh, tries to develop all kinds of elaborate classification terms for different kinds of people. Uh, but that's another subject. The most significant thing here is to reveal the much greater amounts of Native American ancestry that are present within the African American population than most people realize, because they might have been misled by the use of terms like mulatto and also people of color. Colored people included Native Americans, for example, in the United States area. But even with this classification system, you have this system, this classification system, is still working in the interest of the European, or what? Is that true or what? Well, it's, it's working in, in several ways, I think. Uh, it works to obscure the relationships between African Americans and other groups. For example, uh, the Mexican American population has a lot of African ancestry. Uh, by and large, they don't know that, or the African-American population doesn't know that. So it's very difficult to build a bra, uh, bridge of understanding, you see. Uh, and uh, what, we, uh, what we are lacking in many cases is the, the realization that even though there are differences, even though we each have our cultures, which we want to protect and keep alive, we have our community traditions, uh, we have different languages in some cases, but nonetheless, we have also bonds of kinship. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't forget those bonds of kinship.